Malvina Kolodziecak, uh, she will talk about the emergency state in response to the pandemic COVID-19, European and Asian uh, examples. So as I said, Malvina, sorry if I mispronounced your surname, feel free to correct me and the floor is yours for 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, it wasn't so bad. Malvina, is, it's okay, but Koji checked my second with my my surname so i know that it's hard but don't worry um so thank you very much it's always pleasure uh to uh to be unfortunately here not at conference because uh, i'm in poland right now and in warsaw so i understand you good afternoon for you uh too and um well I think that I need something like a 15 minutes because I hope that uh, we will fruitful discussion. So uh, I will try to share my screen. Mm -hmm. And just please tell me if you can see it. We can see it, yes. Okay, so just perfect. Maybe I turn off the camera. Will be a bit easy, easier for me. Okay, so today I would like to say something, few words, really few words about emergency state. As 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 an example, in response to the pandemic COVID-19, I would like to compare um, the Polish regulation and Taiwanese regulation. And maybe it is, seems quite um, bizarre, but I think that uh, we can find some, uh, some good point. And uh, in some level, we really can compare it. So, short agenda, really short introduction. I would like to uh, present some restriction that we, we had or still we have in Poland, also in Taiwan. Then I would like to ask about political security and health security. Maybe it's also a very important point. And then I would like to show you that Taiwan is really good model with fighting uh, with pandemic. And of course, some conclusion and I hope some question. So <clears throat> first of all, Poland and Taiwan have not to decided to introduce any of extraordinary measure. Um, in Poland, we have three kinds of extraordinary measure. We have martial law, state of emergency, and state of natural disaster. In Taiwan, it's only two of them, martial law and state of uh, emergency. So, uh, but it's not mean that we didn't, uh, we didn't uh, have any restriction because we still have some of them. Um, in some European country, in France, for example, or in Czech Republic, the decision of the um, some extraordinary measure was completely different. So, for example, those countries decided uh, to introduce state of emergency. Um, because in Poland and also in Taiwan, uh, we have quite hard history with martial law. It was one of the reasons why we didn't uh, want to um, introduce any of extraordinary measure. And also, I have to say that at the beginning of the fight against the pandemic in Europe, Poland was really a uh, good example, almost, <laughs> almost 
uh, we had we were we we were the uh, we were the model example, but unfortunately only during few weeks. But Taiwan is still recognized as a model example, uh, and I hope that I will show you why. So, <clears throat> to be honest, if we compare some restriction in Poland and some restriction in Taiwan, it's almost the same. Of course, we had to, and in Taiwan also, uh, and probably in a lot of other country, we had to wear masks um, the right way in public transport, in public places, also, we had to take some distance and disinfection and so on and so on. We had more, of course. Um, in few days after decided to introduce something like a pandemic situation in Poland, we decided um, to introduce some restriction like temporary restriction or prohibition of the marketing and use of specific items or food, temporary limitation of functioning of certain institution or role, workplace, like let's say uh, some schools and so on and so on. But you know, the very of this restriction are typical for some Extra, uh, extraordinary measure like state of emergency or state of natural disaster. So it was the question, uh, if we really wanted to use this kind of limitation of human, human rights, why we didn't introduce state of emergency or state of natural disaster? <sighs> the answer is quite complicated because procedure of introducing some extraordinary measure in Poland is quite complicated. But you know, during the same time, Taiwan also did almost the same restriction. So where, where, where is the difference? Why in Poland we had problem? In Taiwan, the problem was almost nothing. I found some uh, some uh, uh, some points, but let me say something different. Also, we have to remember uh, that in Poland we have bills and we have regulation, and the problem with this limitation of human rights was because a lot of restriction and a lot of limitation was introduction by regulation, no by be, no in bill. So it was the biggest problem in, um, in Poland. And I think that still is. In Taiwan, uh, almost, um, almost even, in, uh, even in March, the Miss President said that they have enough legal, uh, legal um, instrument to fight with COVID without any um, limitation from extraordinary measure. So because of earlier experience with SARS, they had really good law, really good bills, and it was completely enough. So even if they also introduce some limitation or use some limitation on human rights, it was because of the bill, not because of the regulation. So completely different level. And the situation right now, also in Taiwan is perfect. In Poland, unfortunately, not really. So um, let's think about September 2020, 2020, sorry, 2020. Um, in September, after holidays, 
in Poland, the number of cases increased immediately. In Taiwan, since April 2020 till um, September 2020, it was zero cases. So the perfect. And unfortunately, in March, the situation was completely different. In March 2021, in Poland, the situation started getting better and better. And in Taiwan, because of two people, unfortunately, not really. So to be honest, Taiwan had really great problem few months ago when in other part of world the situation was getting better right now in taiwan the situation is again perfect because since one week every day the case we can't find any cases in poland unfortunately uh, it seems like a never-ending story because today we had almost 7,000 cases. So on Monday, I'm flying to Romania and I'm not sure uh, if uh, I, I, I have the green card or I will be from, you know, the, the, the country from red zone. I'm not sure about it. So I also wanted I, I, I also wanted to show other compare. If the health security is the same like a political security, or maybe political security seems a bit more important. And before pandemic, it really was like that. Like political security, of course, was very important. Health security was only some kind, let's uh, uh, from, okay, political security, but not so important. Right now, we can say that health security is very important. And even because of health security, Taiwan maybe also can win something in political security because of the good PR we're fighting with pandemic. Because right now, we can say that Taiwan has perfect model with fight. Why it was? First of all, education. People are really care about the some restriction, about the some behavior. So because of the mm, earlier experience with SARS, they don't have any problem to wearing mask, for example, or to have some distance. Um, also, they trust to authority completely. The organization uh, of crisis, let's say cri crisis management is really good because of the risk communication, but also because of the education, the social responsibility is very high. So for the perfect example is um, the very, very simple example. We had some control uh, in the border and we uh, had some limitation with the flight and Taiwan also had the same. But unfortunately, in Taiwan, it was obligatory to take special taxi from airport to, uh, to city center or whatever, but to the hotel for your quarantine. In Poland, we could take some, you know, normal, public communication after flying from different countries. So this is, well, like amazing. So a lot of action in Taiwan was, of course, because of the experience, but also the using, for example, new technology, including 
QR code. Uh, like this QR code, it must be scanning in front of every public places, but also in front of the restaurant. In Poland, uh, yeah, of course, we have something like a paper list and we have to write something, but it doesn't work, to be honest. Uh, because of the new technology, also they, they in Taiwan, they introduce something like a new application. And in the, the first few weeks, this application wasn't so great, but right now it's uh, some other version and this application can find some, you know, risky place or risky situation. So it's very, a very good uh, response. So in current regulation in Poland, we have a lot of gaps about emergency st states. So probably it was also one of the reasons why we didn't want to introdu introduce it. So I think that we should learn from Taiwan, like even if we don't want to, uh, even if we don't want to use any national disaster state or something like that, maybe we can do some simple things. So maybe um, the model of Taiwan is just good because uh, they tested before, so they have experience. Uh, so what we can do, for example, we, ha we have to, unfortunately, but I think that we have to uh, change the, the law. But also, I think that um, maybe we have to um, put more attention to education people. And I think that it's all. So if you have any question, I will be more than glad to say something more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your very interesting presentation, Malvina. Um, and thank you also for stop sharing your screen so that we can move. You stayed perfectly in time. Uh, so we can quickly move to the next panelist. Uh, and we reserve uh, a time for questions at the end of the session. So next panelist is Manuelita Hermes. She will talk about the COVID-19 pandemic in Brazil, the reinforcement of the cooperative federalism by the Supreme Court. Manuelita, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Good morning, good afternoon. My name is Manuelita Hermes. I'm PhD candidate at Sovergata University in Rome, Italy. A Brazilian federal state attorney currently working as judicial clerk at the Brazilian Federal Supreme Court. First of all, I would like to express many thanks to the organizing committee for accepting my paper to this event. And it's always a pleasure for me being here. And uh, thank you very much. My, my presentation is a preliminary outcome from a paper that I'm writing here about the pandemic and the federalism in Brazil. So here uh, during this pandemic, the inaction and the omission have a great relevance now. So I guess we should work with this element and find the way to create responsibilities and uh, maybe sanctions. And I would like to express my, my view about the way Brazil is leading with this pandemic. So after one year, uh, of the beginning of the pandemic, we could uh, analyze, we can analyze here in Brazil, the relationship between powers in the Brazilian legal framework. In particular, on the relations between the federal union, because we are a federation, so the federal union and the other federal levels, 
there is the state members, the federal district, Brasilia, and the municipalities, the cities. So, as I said in the introduction, the, some reflections on the actions or inaction taken to adopt public policies in the country can point out that the historical centralizing dynamics uh, here in the Federation is started to be weakened through the judicial interpretation of the competence competences established by the federal so, uh, constitution. So uh, it's worth mentioning the Latin American context uh, because in many Latin American states, the health crisis arose in the midst of political, economic, and also social crisis. So this pandemic crisis emphasized the strong social inequality and the extreme poverty, and the, and the other side exposes the great wealth accumulated in the hands of a few. So in Brazil, the federal constitution specifically enshrines an emergency rule with the figures of the state of defense and the state of siege. However, the federal government did not resort to the exceptional constitutional provisions during this pandemic. So to deal with the crisis, to deal with the pandemic, each branch had to act in order to provide measures, such as specific status, constitutional amendments we had here, coordination of public policies, and also the judicial review. So the three branches needed to pave the way of facing the pandemic and its social economic effects in Brazil. However, the effects of the pandemic were felt both in the separation of powers and the vertical plan of the federation. I mean, the relation between the federal union, the state members and the municipalities. So we have here the presidentialism that was established by the, the constitution of 1891. I mean, 130 years ago, uh, inspired by the American constitution. And then we have the federal state and the re judicial review. But the current constitution had to deal with this balance of powers between the federal union and the other federal entities. So the constitution now framework. Yes. yes. So the constitutional framework maintains the federalism and a large protection of fundamental rights, especially social rights as the right to health. So the constitution of 1988 created a system, it's named unified health system, and its functioning has to respect the principles of universality and equity. Furthermore, the, the division of competences and powers is enshrined in the Constitution, and it provides the division of competence between the federal center and the other federal entities, as I said. So this is the cooperative federalism uh, that our Constitution from 1988 established for the country. So the right to health the health is a shared competence between the three levels of the Brazilian Federation. So there is a competing legislative competence shared by the Federal Union, the states, the federal district regarding to defense of health. So uh, in the tax, the constitutional tax, this common competence is for the union states and municipalities also to take care of our health. So the president, the state governors and the mayors may act 
in order to establish measures to protect the health. And also, each legislative branch has federative competence. So the Federal Union has the competence to enact general status, general standards about right to health. On the other hand, the states, the federal district, and the municipalities have competence to enact specific stages related to the local conditions. So this is uh, the, the way the constitutional framework provides the relation between each corner of our federation. So in sum, this was the core tension during the first days of the pandemic and also nowadays of the pandemic here in Brazil. I mean, the cooperative federalism enshrined in the federal constitution. <clears throat> so here within the, the Brazilian uh, judicial architecture, we have the federal Supreme Court. That is the highest court that has the competence to discuss and judge cases related to the allocation of federal competences. So I select three cases related to the federal competence and the COVID-19 pandemic. Firstly, during the earlier times, I mean, during the first phase of the pandemic in our country, in March 2020, last year, the health protection issue uh, reaches the Federal Supreme Court. So this action, this direct unconstitutionality action, 6341, deals with how to exercise the competence to define essential activities during the pandemic, and therefore adopt restriction measures related to the services. So the rapporteur of the case Justice Marco Aurelio issued a provisional order that recognized the joint federal competence related to the right to health. So the federal union, the states, the federal districts, and the municipalities are allowed to act and legislate in the field of public health accordingly to the local conditions. So the court ruled that the federal levels have the competence with this cooperative federalism in Brazil to adopt normative and administrative measures to face the COVID-19 pandemic. The presence uh, of the Republic was not satisfied with this decision because he would like to concentrate the powers of deciding the way to live with, to, with the pandemic here in Brazil. But with this decision, all the levels could decide uh, which measures adopt. So I consider this case the most important one for defining the contours of the Brazilian Federation during the pandemic. Actually, it was the leading case, case about federalism and COVID-19 outbreak. So any conflict according, uh, according to the course must be resolved in the light of the better protection of the rights to health. Then the second case I would like to emphasize is related to the second phase of the pandemic here in Brazil. Actually, there were two uh, direct unconstitutionality actions about the same problem, 6586 and 6587. Once more, the omission of the center the omission of the president of the Republic of the Federal Union reached the Federal Supreme Court in relation to the vaccination programs. So the court ruled again the common competence to take care of the health and then authorized the states, federal district, Brasilia, and municipalities to implement specific vaccination programs. So, uh, the, in, the, in other words, the court ruled that the competence of the Ministry of, uh, of Health 
to coordinate the national immunization program and define vaccines that are part of the national immunization calendar does not exclude that of the states, the federal district and municipal councils to establish prophylactic and therapies accordingly to the local conditions. And more recently, uh, we had this last one, this claim of non-compliance with five fundamental precepts, eight, four, eight. And I don't know in which phase we are <laughs> of the pandemic, but uh, this case is about the possibility of the heads of the executive powers of the member states to participate in the parliamentary inquiry that was launched to investigate the actions and the omissions, the inactions of the federal government in confrontation with the pandemic. So this commission, this parliamentary inquiry has the task to scrutinize the government's overall handling of the pandemic. So in a, a singular decision, I mean, monocratic decision, uh, laid up uh, appro approved by the court by a referendum, the justice Rosa Weber decided that it's not possible to convene the governors to go to this inquiry. She decided based on the separation of powers and the independence between powers. And then the parliamentary inquiry is an arm of the National Congress when exercising its investigation function. Also, and here like I would like to emphasize because of uh, uh, this subject, that the second element used by the judicial reasoning, which has been the, uh, was the federal uh, federative principle, more precisely the need of harmony in the federation, because <laughs> we have also almost a fight between the president, the governors, etc. And then the judges decided that it's essential to have a cooperation with balance, respect, solidarity, loyalty to the federative pact, and duty to of fidelity. So. Uh, uh, as there is the autonomy of federal states, uh, state members, their heads, the executive uh, branch, cannot be summoned to compulsory to the parliamentary inquiry. So uh, we can see again the, the preeminence of the role of the judiciary here, the federal Supreme Court, in shaping the cooperative federalism in Brazil. Uh, that's not static, it's completely dynamic. So as a conclusion, we can see that uh, regarding Brazil, uh, we are still building a new, a more cooperative model of federalism during this pandemic. So it's true that uh, our federalism has already been developing, even in relation to the distribution of expenses and income between federal union and state members, also by jurisprudence of the federal Supreme Court. And uh, cooperative federalism is gradually becoming stronger, uh, thanks also to the federal Supreme Court decisions. And uh, I was reading an article, uh, Marie uh, Christine Fuchs, Professor Marie Christine Fuchs, that wrote a paper about the German federal experience during the COVID 19 pandemic. And she found out that elements of the cooperative federalism were also developed there, partly normative, but mostly by informal tools. So this character is, is very interesting, the informal elements conventions, conference, and commissions, etc. But here, we don't have this informal level. We, we can see uh, the, dynam the dynamism of the federative, uh, cooperative federalism here, but also with something that's not formal, uh, a, judicial decision, a judicial decision. Okay, so uh, leading with this pandemic, uh, decentralization on the one hand, 
and allowed a fight against the pandemic according to the characteristics or the dimensions of the country. Uh, Brazil is a continental country. So, but uh, on the other hand, it reveals the lack, unfortunately, the world knows about that, the lack of coordination or cooperation between the, the federative entities and the lack of leadership of the president uh, to face the challenges generated by the, this crisis. Uh, with this proportion. So in the context of the, the COVID-19 pandemic, Brazilian federal levels have faced a real federative crisis uh, <laughs> with the, the federalist architecture. And the Supreme Court since the beginning, as I said, the first case that I said, and still nowadays has played uh, the role of a federal constitutional court. And it has fixed the constitutional exegesis of the Brazilian cooperative federalism conception with the focus on consolidating a greater balance between the federal entities. The debates over federalism in Brazil outlined the tension between the constitutional rhetoric and the political reality of the federalism. So the, co the court reinforced the cooperative framework that we have of the federalist competence, recognizing the need for respect of this competence without subordination between the pluralities of legal orders. So this reinforcement of the cooperative federalism is a kind of judicial decision making strategy for guaranteeing the implementation of public policy to face the coronavirus pandemic here in Brazil. So this pandemic has changed the dynamic in the federal relations. And in short, we can uh, conclude that despite the political crisis, the cooperative federalism was judicially reinforced in Brazil and this development is particularly significant and important to protect and promote the right to health uh, in the country. So thank you uh, one more time for your attention and the opportunity. And I have uh, here my email if you need to contact and then it's all right to hear the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manuelita. Uh, as always, it was a pleasure to hear your thoughts on your country uh, and uh, I'm sure that we will have uh, uh, questions for you in the Q&A session. Uh, but without further ado, we move to the next panelist, which is uh, uh, Luca Ettore Perriello, uh, who is going to present on terminating or renegotiating the aftermath of COVID-19 pandemic on European contract law. So Luca, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Valentina, for the introduction, and I'm really honored to be here today with you, uh, though I have to admit that I feel a little bit like a fish out of water because I'm not a public lawyer, I'm a private lawyer, um, and I teach uh, private law and corporate law. Uh, however, I hope I will get some interesting uh, insights and comments uh, uh, from you guys. So let me share the screen uh, with my... PowerPoint presentation. I hope you can see it. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. So COVID-19 has been a real stress test for contract law, uh, challenging the traditional principle that covenants must be observed in spite of external circumstances making them more onerous. And this is the pacta sunt servanda principle. A blind application of this principle in times of COVID-19 would lead to outcomes incompatible with the duties of fairness and loyalty in the performance of contracts or in common law systems which do not know a general duty of good faith to outcomes in any case incompatible with the intentions of the contracting parties. Had the parties foreseen a similar development of the pandemic at the time of the conclusion of their contract, 
they will not have concluded it at all or have concluded it under very different conditions. The response fashion by the contract laws of the most influential legal systems around the world has been varied. While the common law galaxy is traditionally restrictive in the face of contingencies and tends to deny judicial remedies, which may interfere with party autonomy, continental European legal systems have proved more sensitive to channeling the pandemic event into the civil law doctrines already consolidated in the written codes. Now, it is difficult to piece together how the pandemic has impacted contracts in some cases, performance has become impossible. For example, airlines forced to cancel flights as a result of travel bans. In other, more problematic cases, performance has simply become more burdensome, such as a tenant of commercial property being required to pay rent despite the closure of his business. In the event performance has become impossible, the legal systems concerned respond with the force majeure doctrine. The doctrine appears in most civil law code, codes like the French Civil Code, Article 1218, uh, force majeure terminates the contract and the parties are released from their obligations. So COVID-19 appears to meet all the requirements of the force majeure doctrine. However, the doctrine seems unsuitable to deal with the consequences of the pandemic because pecuniary obligations are never impossible, since impossibility must be objective, that is, must be such for any promisor. Actually, some Italian scholars have advocated for the uh, inesigibilità, which in Italian means unenforceability, of pecuniary debts in the face of the exceptionality of COVID-19 and the risks that compliance with governmental measures may entail for the survival of many businesses. However, this theory, in my opinion, is not fully satisfactory. It is true that many businesses find it difficult to pay, but there are just as many, despite being affected by government measures, which continue to pay for supplies and leases simply because they have more liquidity or have drawn up a financial plan. Excusing the struggling businesses who transfer the business risk to the counterparty who is to receive the supply of goods or services or the rent or the premises. And yet, for this theory to be consistent, the business risk would have to be transferred in full together with the associated benefits and the powers to manage the business with the consequence of allowing that counterparty to also share in the profits and the power to administer the business. But this conclusion is obviously uh, absurd. Solidarity cannot be a one-way street. One cannot look exclusively at the promiser's position because it may well be the case that is the promisee to be harmed by non-performance without considering that a justified failure to perform the contract of the first promisor could trigger chain defaults, thereby seriously damaging the entire economy. What we are experiencing is a market crisis, not a crisis of a single contract, which as such requires a balancing extending to all the relevant interests at stake. Now, the second situation is potentially more difficult to handle. That is when, as a result of the change of circumstances, performance remains possible, but becomes more onerous for the promisor. This goes by the name of hardship. So some legal systems, which we may call open systems, consider it unfair, unjust, contrary to good faith, to force the promisor to perform a contract that has become of disproportionate economic value. In these systems, the constitutional instances of prevention of social injustices demand to construe contract law as having primarily redistributive purposes. The economic benchmark is the social market economy in German, uh, Soziale Marktwirtschaft, prevailing in Germany since the end of World War II, 
which is particularly considerate of the phenomena of social distress and marginality and determined to counter the abuse of economic power in the negotiations. These socioeconomic upheavals that crossed Germany during the two world wars and the suffering experienced by the Germans during the Nazi regime explain the social orientation of the German system and the divergence existing with common law jurisdictions in governing supervening circumstances. Historically, as early as the Middle Ages, the theorization of the Rebus Sixtantibus Clause was the first dangerous inroad into the Pacta Sunt Servanda principle, requiring that any contract be binding, provided that the circumstances existing at the time of its conclusion remain the same. Fearing that the Rebus Sixtantibus Clause could undermine party autonomy, legal certainty, and the tenets of economic liberalism, the drafters of the German Civil Code decided not to include it in the new code. It was not until 2001 that paragraph 313 of the German Civil Code, BGB, was amended to cover cases where there is a significant change of the circumstances which became the basis of a contract. In such cases, parties may ask the court for judicial adaptation of the contract. Now, France has joined the ranks of the open systems. In 2016, Article 1195 of the French Civil Code was amended in an attempt to codify the hardship doctrine, which in French is called imprevision. The article now gives the party required to perform a contract which has become excessively onerous due to a change of circumstances which was unforeseeable at the time of the conclusion of the contract, the right to ask the other party for a renegotiation. In the event of refusal or failure to renegotiate, the parties may discharge the contract or ask the court for its adaptation. The contingencies arising from COVID-19 seem to fall fully within the new Article 1195 of the French Civil Code. However, predictability is a slippery yardstick because it depends on a variety of factors such as the duration of the contract, the longer the contract it is, the more predict unpredictable the event will be at the time of its conclusion. The placement of the contract in the international market where price fluctuations are usually higher than those occurring in the domestic markets and therefore more predictable. The subjective qualities of the contracting parties. Indeed, if the parties are unsophisticated, or involved in transactions of small value and on a small scale, they might consider the non-occurrence of a given circumstance as a certain fact, although the probability of its occurrence is objectively high. The opposite is true for highly sophisticated or uh, large-scale parties. So these remarks show that discharging the burden of proof in a judgment obtained that the adaptation or termination of the contract may be difficult, and this would make the new Article 1195 of the French Civil Code unattractive for the most substantial commercial transactions, which in any case usually contain force majeure or hardship uh, uh, clauses. So on the opposite side of the spectrum, like the more liberal and capitalistic Anglo-American systems, which show a lower sensitivity to the social instances that would justify the excuse of the promisor from excessively onerous performance. A general hardship doctrine has been met with hostility by those claiming that contracting parties at the moment of stipulation allocate explicitly or tacitly all the possible risks that may condition performance. From this point of view, a judicial reallocation of risks through the hardship doctrine would be an interference with freedom of contract unjustifiable on the grounds of economic efficiency. Economic imbalances may not even be adjusted through a corrective use of good faith, which has always struggled to establish itself as a fully fledged doctrine in the common law world. Accordingly, the hardship doctrine, 
is foreign to the English common law, a contract under English law can only be discharged if after its conclusion, its substance has, been, has become impossible and this is frustration of contract or the commercial purpose has been destroyed and this is frustration of purpose. Performance cannot be excused when a change of circumstances, and actually here we, saw, we see a notable difference with continental legal systems, has made performance simply more onerous. Excessive onerousness does not in itself frustrate the contract unless there is a fundamental or radical change in the originally agreed obligations so that the promisor would have to perform a radically different contract if not actually impossible. Comparing continental and common law systems shows how the doctrine of hardship is the rule in the former, the exception in the latter. Now, differences are not confined to the requirements, but extend to the remedies to govern contingencies. The French Civil Code provides for determination by operational law of contracts whose performance has become definitely impossible. In common law jurisdictions, termination under the frustration doctrine is the only remedy available to the parties. Actually, this charge does not appear an entirely adequate remedy. In long-term contracts, hardship may be only temporary and the parties may still be interested in continuing their relationship and receiving future performance. Besides, repayment obligations following this charge may expose the party to a liquidity crisis or bankruptcy. These reasons have prompted various jurisdictions to identify a remedy better suited to the peculiarities of the case, such as judicial adaptation of the contract, which now appears in the French Civil Code and the German Civil Code. However, in my opinion, it is very questionable that the courts hold the key to ending the economic imbalances caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Revising a contract requires the technical expertise on market conditions, as well as information on the subjective costs and benefits of the contracting parties, which the courts do not always possess. And the decision may come too late when the situation of impossibility or hardship has ceased and may even be useless or harmful. So given the limits of judicial adaptation, we shall consider whether the best remedy is to let the parties renegotiate their contract quickly and away from the courts. As we saw, the French Civil Code gives one party the right to call for a renegotiation of the contract, which the other party may either accept or refuse. The Italian Civil Code contains no rule on renegotiation. However, in the face of COVID-19, some scholars have theorized an obligation on contracting parties to renegotiate their contract based on the duty of good faith. The violation of this duty to renegotiate would determine a breach of contract. At a time like this of social and economic emergency, renegotiation of contracts has unquestionable advantages because it is likely to be quicker and less costly than a judicial adaptation. By renegotiating, the parties themselves, not a third party, rewrite their agreement, saving their existing relationship and not preventing future contracts. Moreover, by renegotiating the contract, the parties may not only address current contingencies that require immediate adjustment, but also define a medium to long-term path, taking into account the expected time frame for a return to normality. However, the advantages of renegotiation exist to the extent that they are left to the voluntary choice of the contracting parties. Imposing a legal duty to renegotiate all contracts that have become unbalanced would infringe freedom of contract. The relationship of trust 
between the parties may have fallen out, though that relationship is essential not only to reach a renegotiation agreement, but also to make it work. But above all, a legal duty to renegotiate is detrimental to the very instances of social solidarity invoked by its supporters. Consider a lease agreement. If theoretically a reduction of the rent may appear to be in accordance with good faith in order to cope with the financial hardship of the tenant, in practice, this renegotiation may not be fair where the landlord economically depends on the lease and has no other sources of income, but at the same time continues to pay taxes or has a pending loan agreement for the purchase of that property whose payments have not been suspended. Think again of a restaurant owner forced during the lockdown to close the rented premises to the public, but who in the meantime has benefited from tax credits and layoff schemes for his employees, and has made considerable profits from the takeaway business, is it really fair to grant him the right to impose a revision of the rent on the other party? And in my opinion, the answer is no. So identifying who is the party deserving of greater protection in an exceptional context of economic paralysis in which every party seems to be the weaker party is an effort that cannot be left to judicial discretion or imposed on the parties through a legal duty to renegotiate all contracts whose economic balance has been altered by the pandemic. The government of solidarity must be entrusted to the lawmakers. So for example, to parliaments, to governments, not to private contracting parties. Parties should be given the option of renegotiating their contract. In the event of a refusal or failure to renegotiate the contract, the only remedy should be the termination of the agreement because judicial adaptation poses the wide ranging problems that we just uh, saw. It is not surprising that in common law systems, the general remedy provided for by the frustration doctrines is automatic discharge of the contract. Forcing parties to remain in a contract that no longer meets their interests may be an efficient remedy if only because it would generate further litigation. Moreover, the very provision of an automatic discharge of the contract could encourage the parties to negotiate a new contract in order not to disrupt their business relationship. If litigation ensues, the court should be granted the sole power to ascertain a discharge that has already occurred by operation of law. The simple alternative between discharge and voluntary renegotiation of contracts which have become useless or excessively burdensome in times of pandemic appears to be the fairest and most efficient solution on the assumption that instances of social solidarity are adequately protected by governments and parliaments. So thank you for your attention. This is the end of my presentation and uh, I'm available for any questions or comments. I'm sorry, I hope you can hear me. I had some problems with my connection, but yes, I guess now you can hear me. Uh, thank you very much, Luca, for your presentation. Though you're not a public law scholar, I think we could follow you and I think you will find fruitful questions in uh, the audience. We see that there is a good audience, so I won't take too much time and I immediately open the floor um, for questions. Uh, there are still people that are asking to be admitted. So please, if you have any question, either you can write them in the chat and I will read it for uh, our panelists or you can raise your hand and I will give you the floor. Um, I'm sorry if I will mispronounce, but Shige Matsui is asking for the floor, please. 
Hi, uh, my name is Shige. I'm originally from Japan. I wrote a piece on the Japanese government response to the COVID-19 in the American journals. I'm now living in Canada, so I have some knowledge about the Canadian response as well. So the, each of the speakers' the presentation raises a very interesting uh, issues to compare. And I, I uh, strongly urge everyone to keep on interest in this uh, field and uh, expand your focus much more broadly. So this is uh, the pandemic uh, response is a very broad subject matters. So first of all, I guess that it is very important to lay out what kind of a policy was adopted by the government in response to the COVID-19. So this is the first issue. And the second issue is what kind of legal authorities the government has and the, the statute and regulations and what kind of measures can be adapted. So this is the first question we need to inquire. And then we have to, to discuss about what kind of government measures indeed the government has adapted in response to the COVID-19. So most of the countries in the world first didn't realize the dangerousness or contagiousness of this uh, COVID-19. So they didn't take any uh, strong action. So to that extent, that is a, a fatal error. And I guess gradually, uh, most of the country came to realize the extreme dangers and the contagiousness. So I guess gradually, this, uh, the government response has shifted. So most of the countries uh, has adapted the emergency uh, situation in, in many countries. But everybody knows that what was called the emergency was strong, uh, significantly different depending upon the countries. In China, for example, city of Wuhan was totally locked down. People were prohibited from moving to another part of the China. And in Italy and France, uh, they have introduced the police forces to uh, prohibit going out. So to that extent, the lockdown was very strong. Whereas in Japan, lockdown was merely an advisory. So no force was used, and um, uh, indeed, Japanese government didn't have any legal authority to force the public to obey the government orders. So this is a, a significant different, uh, difference in the state of emergency up in each of the countries. So I guess um, also this kind of issue is also related to the medical system, the institution and hospitals are land and who is in charge and uh, who is going to dictate uh, all kind of healthcare decisions as, as well. So in Canada, uh, healthcare and uh, treatment of the patients are left for each of the province, which is a local matters. So the, the uh, federal government only has the power of immigration. To that extent, there is a significant um, uh, division and the gap between the federal government and the provinces. So I guess that this is significantly different depending upon your country. So I hope that uh, I, you can share uh, some more information about your countries and your um, uh, general system in order to elaborate on your um, uh, outcomes of your researches. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Let's see if we have any other question that we can collect uh, or otherwise we leave the floor to our panelists. So is there anyone who would like to ask questions? Manuelita, raise the hand. So you want to ask a question to someone else, Manuelita, right? Right. Okay. Please. <laughs> Thank you. And congratulations to Malvina and Luca. I have a question to each one. Uh, Malvina, here I wrote a, a kind of curious because uh, you said that in the beginning of the pandemic, Poland as a, a model uh, uh, example uh, during a few weeks. So I am curious, uh, actually, I, I don't know which were the policies and why it was considered a, a model for you. So if you could explain why during few weeks during the beginning of the pandemic, you you consider Poland as a, a model. And, uh, uh, here in Brazil, we have a, an issue related to private contracts, especially related to educational 
contracts uh, because with the use of Zoom and other methodology of, of education, some students, especially um, from medicine courses, uh, try to re renegotiate the contracts. Even without suffering the economic effects of financial crisis, for example. So only because the classes now are uh, using Zoom. So it's not related to a real effect, a financial effect. So I don't know, it's a curiosity also. I don't know if you have some information about a, a situation like this abroad and if you have an opinion also about the solution and the application of the solidarity principle in, in cases like this, because maybe we can renegotiate, renegotiate contracts related to someone who is suffering with the, the crisis, the pandemic crisis financially talking, but not uh, another student that has the, the, also the, the same income, but only because of the, the space of the classes and he would like to renegotiate the contract. So thank you, but these are my questions. Thank you very much, Manuelita. I guess we can start answering these two questions, these questions from uh, these two presenters, and then we move to uh, next questions. So uh, maybe we can start uh, uh, from the end. So Luca can start first, uh, then Manuelita, and then Malvina, uh, just in order to invert the order. Uh, in which you presented. So, Luca, please uh, feel free to answer, comment. Yeah, uh, yeah. Else. Okay. So, I, I'm gonna answer uh, Manuelita's uh, question, uh, which is very interesting. So, thank you for asking this question. Uh, to be honest, in Italy, uh, the, um, the 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 bulk of the educational system is a public system, at least in university. So it's not a matter of a, a contract that the student signs with the, the university, really. So in that case, there have been uh, uh, actions. So actions have been taken by uh, several universities. Uh, for example, even the university where I work. Uh, where the uh, student fees were uh, reduced uh, and the, the scholarship uh, were uh, increased, especially for uh, low income students. Um, so if I um, understand your question correctly, uh, this is probably a matter of uh, educational contracts between uh, like uh, private university and, uh, uh, and students attending these universities. Uh, in my opinion, uh, the problem here is that uh, you have to decide whether uh, solidarity uh, should be uh, left to private parties of the contract or should be a responsibility of the government. So in my opinion, solidarity should be a responsibility of the government. So it should be the government to help uh, the students in need uh, to uh, pay their fees. Uh, so it's not like a matter of forcing a renegotiation of that contract on universities uh, uh, because you have to consider the whole picture and you have to be careful in balancing the interests at stake. So probably if all the students demand to renegotiate their contracts, in that case, probably I would say the university would go bankrupt or the university would be forced to fire uh, employees, for example. So like a crisis, it's a crisis of the contract, of, of a single contract that originates other uh, contract crisis, other um, situations which are difficult to handle in a, in a private law scenario. So if, in my opinion, the best option would be uh, for governments to, to take action in these cases. So I hope I will, I answered your question. Perfectly, thank you. Welcome. Okay, so Manuelita, uh, is there any comment that you would like to make uh, with regard to the first question we received? Uh, any in-depth analysis of your case you would like to advance? Okay, uh, thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Matsui. And here in Brazil, we had, uh, we used, as I said, uh, each branch used adopted measures. So 
the, con the National Congress, for example, uh, made an amendment to the Constitution because we have limits to the financial use uh, to the budget. So we had to make a, an amendment to the Constitution to have uh, the way to construct a new budget. It's called war budget uh, to fight the pandemic. So we had, in the beginning, uh, the Constitution was amended. And also we have status related to the, the pandemic, a lot of status with the, the possibility of adopt measures as lockdown and uh, etc. But as I said, the use, the administrative implementation of the federal uh, statute was given, uh, the, the responsibility was given to each federal entity. So why, uh, uh, while the president of the Republic uh, uh, said that he would not never uh, uh, do a lockdown because it's not necessary, it would not, not uh, 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 say that the mask is necessary. The Federal Supreme Court said that each entity would uh, uh, adopt the measure according to the the pandemic in the, the city, in the state, etc. So we are a federation with 26 state members and one federal district, and each one uh, 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 had to fight the pandemic with the, the local, the federal rule, the federal status, the local legislation also, and the uh, the decrees also the, from the executive and each uh, judiciary branch also federalism within the federalism was uh, had the competence to verify the use of each measure. I guess I answered your question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we will ask Malvina if she wants to add something or ask uh, Manuelita's question. Mm -hmm. Of course. Uh, thank you very much, Manuelita. So first of all, just I think that maybe less than two weeks we were like a model uh, with fighting with pandemic because uh, the reason is very simple. Uh, we was the leader in the statistic of small increase in infection in the European Union. And uh, we really, uh, our response was really, really quick. But unfortunately, Late uh, then the next step, um, maybe it we should um, we should introduce some of let's say a state of uh, natural disaster, but we still um, thought that the, the the better thing is stay with whole limitation in um, in uh, in the in the level of regulation. So it was the problem, like we had quite good response, like we had good limitation, good restriction, but it shouldn't be in this kind of level of legal acts. So um, I think that, uh, yeah, we, we were like model for a few, few days, maybe two weeks, uh, but only because we have uh, really, really small uh, increase in, in, in the infection. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much to Malvina too. Is there any other question for our panelists? Uh, we still have sorry. plenty of time. So Lorenzo Serafinelli, please. Yep, uh, I have a question for uh, Luca. Um, I mean, we have in the Italian constitution, uh, article 33, um, that establishes the principle that uh, private entities and private persons can actually establish schools and institutions of education without any cost to the state. So at no cost to the state. I was wondering how you reconcile the idea that um, governments have to take the responsibility on contracts and renegotiations of contracts and with, with, with Article 33 of our constitution. If, if I understood correctly your position, 
the position is that even though you have a private university, you as a, uh, as a public entity have to intervene, the government has to intervene in order to uh, uh, bail out, I mean, uh, the, the university and avoid universities, private universities to go bankrupt. Uh, however, at the same time, and on the other hand, you have Article 33 that says and establishes a quiet, clear principle that um, uh, whereby you cannot actually do that. And so I was wondering how do you reconcile this, this to uh, but, the situation? But uh, well, actually, I'm not saying that uh, the government should save private universities. Uh, I'm just saying that probably the government should help students in need. So the, the problem here is that uh, like you, you will not have a renegotiation of the contract. So the contract remains that. Um, the, it, it's just that uh, the, 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 the actions to be taken should be taken by uh, public authorities. So the, the burden should not fall to uh, the private parties, say the private university and the students attending that uh, university. So I'm not saying that the government should save the private universities from uh, uh, bankruptcy. May I add something? Yeah, or... yeah, sure, sure. May... Of course, please, please. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I think you're correct in saying that uh, governments do not have to save and cannot save uh, private university. Um, however, if you uh, envision the, the possibility that government, um, the, the Italian government helps uh, students who go to who attend private university, you imply that in an indirect way, uh, government has to take the burden of saving these people and uh, uh, sustain private university, even though... Know. even. I'm not saying that just the students attending private universities. I'm I'm saying all the students. So yeah, yeah. of course, uh, all this this action should address all the students. So both attending public universities and students attending uh, private universities. So I will not confine my uh, reasoning to private universities. Of course. Yeah. No. I, I was focusing on private universities. Indeed. Because uh, mm -hmm. I think that's not possible that governments, uh, I mean, the Italian government uh, takes the burden of saving those people. Why? That, Why? Because you have Article 33, which is... But, here but, you, know, but, but, but you know that uh, the, the private education and public education in Italy are put on an equal footing, are placed on an equal footing, so they have the same... Uh, recognition and yes. the same legal the same legal dignity and this is a principle that is established within uh, our uh, constitution as well so i'm not saying that, uh, that the government should save private universities of course i'm just saying that uh, the the burden the, the the solidarity should be a responsibility of the government and of course should address all the students yeah, I was looking at saying that. So, so if I understand your point correctly, this this is the, the, the discussion now is moving to a private and public education. But if I understand your uh, position correctly, you think that the government should not help students attending private universities? Yeah, I think government could not. Could because not. I don't, I don't know. I, I'm just thinking on it. Know. Okay. Yeah, I, mean, I, I would say this can be a matter of judicial interpretation. I don't know whether Manuelita would agree with me, <laughs> but maybe which will be the limits in supporting a student attending a different kind of university from public one can be maybe a matter of interpretation. But it's nice to see that uh, uh, we have uh, um, 
a common floor for finding topics on which arguing, even if we have public and private lawyers together. So in the end, this is the nice part of being lawyers. Uh, I'm sorry if I interrupted you, but I would like to see if there are other questions, maybe focused uh, on the panels or on the um, um, presentations also of the other panelists. Uh, otherwise, I promise I will leave you talking about this for the remaining time. <laughs> There's no problem for me. Uh, so is there... Sorry, maybe for Maldina or Manuelita? No, only related to this case. <laughs> Uh, because it's a case we are facing here, the Federal Supreme Court. So in a case, talk about it because it was at the virtual uh, 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 judgment, and then one justice asked to to go to the to the video conference debate because it's relevant. And my uh, I work at the opinion of, uh, of the justice, uh, and the, and we we didn't. Uh, thought about the possibility to, to go to the government and, and the, uh, because we, here we have also the principles of economic principles, etc. And that we propose as opinion and we have majority or, uh, already. So <laughs> I can talk about it. Each case must be uh, analyzed. It's the single case considering the nature of the course so I, I talked about medicine course, it's completely different from a law, a law course. So if the student uh, had a lack in the formation, I mean, you say that a, a period without going to the hospital with practical classes, et cetera, and this is a lack in, the, in the, his formation. Also, if the student actually has a, a financial problem, uh, be, uh, uh, because of the, the pandemic, because I am public servant, servant and uh, fortunately I, I have my, only each month I have the same uh, uh, salary. And if I had a, 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 a daughter, a son going to the university, why I would like to ask for some kind of renegotiation re re of the contract if I can afford. And maybe this is the solidarity. So if I can afford, the other student that cannot, he can get some renegotiated, uh, renegotiate the contract. And I will provide the same for the institution. Uh, do not go to bankrupt. So it's something like the, each case. And we had a, a, a thesis with a, a lot of uh, 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 conditions to to guide uh, the judge, each judge in the whole country, to analyze the the case and then decide about renegotiating or not because it was something general. So there is a pandemic. The class are not pre uh, in presence. So the university uh, has not the same costs. So uh, each student has has the right to renegotiate the contract. In some, this was the case. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe this can be a good position reconciling also Luca and Lorenzo in their approach to the topic. No, but okay. I mean, uh, do we have any other question? <laughs> Please, Luca. Yes, of course. No, I just, I just want to add uh, something uh, which concerns uh, the renegotiation of contract based on solidarity, based on good faith, on fair dealing, which are very uh, interesting ideas that uh, everybody agrees with these concepts, of course. Uh, most of these concepts are enshrined in the most uh, developed constitutions in the world. However, the problem when negotiating contracts is that uh, you may create uh, a chain default. So, so for example, I imagine this situation in a university where you have a lot of students that are in uh, uh, financial need. So they ask to impose a renegotiation on the university, but then the university may become uh, bankrupt. So, and also the, the matter of lease. So there was a discussion in Italy concerning leases uh, with a lot of tenants uh, uh, expecting to renegotiate their rents 
in my opinion, this is not a solution. Uh, of course, you may consider that a tenant in need, a tenant that uh, has shut down his, his or her business, has no money to pay the rent, but probably you, you also have to consider the position of the landlord, because it might be the case that the landlord has no other sources of income. The landlord is still paying uh, the, uh, the loan to buy that property. So it's the, main, it's the, it's the same concept here. Um, the problem of solidarity, in my opinion, should, should not fall to a contracting party, it should be a matter of the state. So the state should help the students in need without distinguishing between private or public universities, in my opinion, and the state should help the tenants in need and so on. So that's uh, all I wanted to add. I would say that this seems to me uh, a very good dream to dream, but I'm not sure which state may have the money to effort all this solidarity. Uh, but in theory, I, I agree with you that it would be uh, very, very nice to see a state that can support uh, all these kind of issues. Okay, so let me come back to my role of just chairing the panel for asking if someone else would like to make comments or questions for our panelists. Okay, if not, Lorenzo. Please. I have a question for Malvina, which does not deal with the with the issue of education and renegotiation concept. Um, um, I have recently read a book of which uh, the title of which I will provide you in a moment if I can recall it. And I have seen that this author uh, divides um, states into two categories. Uh, on one side, you have quarantinist states, quarantinist nations, uh, which um, take severe measures to constrain people in homes and, uh, and avoid uh, the spread of contagions. And on the other side, you have sanitation, uh, sanitations, uh, uh, which are states that uh, do not actually care about um, limitation of people in homes, but simply put, they uh, prefer to let people go around and let the business uh, go on because they are interested, uh, pretty much interested in, uh, in this, uh, in this in, in economy that doesn't want to, to go this route. And uh, do you know, I, I was wondering if Malbina uh, think that, thinks that these two categories uh, fits the, uh, the description she has rendered of Poland on one side and of uh, Taiwan on the other side. Okay, thank you very much. Well, uh, I didn't know uh, this uh, categories, two categories, like we, we have a bit different uh, definition. Uh, and in our regulation, we mix, I think that two, two of these categories in uh, one on the on the other hand uh, on the one hand uh, in um, this regulation from uh, extraordinary extra extraordinary measure and in second uh, uh, on the other hand in this normal let's say um, legal uh, regulation uh, so uh, this is the problem like we mix them so uh, for example uh, in taiwan uh, it can be a bit uh, different uh, because whole things are from the normal uh, regulation from the bills. So um, I think that this is the, the, the most important thing. So um, Taiwan uh, wasn't, uh, has any problem with economic issue because uh, even if they had some restriction uh, it was like a very, very light, very, very simple. So um, in, in Poland, the, the limitation was very, uh, in, in some moment was very hard uh, and very with big influence uh, for also economic, but also um, uh, for personal budget. So it was the problem. Like the, this kind of limitation was in the regulation only, no without, no, no with bills.
So, yeah, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Malvina, for your answer. Any other question? Okay, if we don't, let me thank uh, the law school of the University of Wisconsin for virtually guesting us uh, uh, here. Um, uh, thank you to our panelists, uh, uh, Malvina, Manel Manuelita, and Luca for their very interesting presentations. I hope that uh, next time our Young Comparativist Committee Congress uh, can be held in person so that we will have the opportunity to meet uh, in person finally. Um, and meanwhile, I guess uh, uh, it was a fruitful meeting for all of us. Uh, I hope it was for you. It for sure was for me. And uh, I hope we will have the chance to stay in contact, to continue to be part of the YCC and uh, uh, let increase the uh, chances and the potentials of this big community. So it was my pleasure to spend this time with you and I hope to see you soon uh, in person. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you very much and have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 All right, so we did it early today. Yeah, we finished a little bit early. Yes, it's true. Okay, no problem. I was going to say if anybody wanted to still mill around and talk, I would hold it open till 12.45, but it's I think they, they are leaving. But in any case, thank you very much for your help and for being with us in case something went wrong. Oh, thank you. No problem whatsoever. You have a good afternoon or a good a rest of your time for today. <laughs> have a nice uh, day. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>